Okay, let's get started with part two of compliance. And don't want to be here, want to be farther along. There we go. So let's talk about when uh, compliance to authority goes wrong. Uh, and uh, this is a complex idea, but I think it's very important. And let's start out here. Uh, here we have uh, Warren Buffett. And if you know anything about business, you know Warren Buffett is you know, truly amazing and blah, blah, blah. And here's an article, 23 super successful people share the best advice they ever received. And so, you know, we have in this article people who've made tons of money like Warren Buffett uh, talking about, you know, folksy advice. Uh, never forget, you can tell a guy to go to hell tomorrow. Uh, so keep your mouth shut today. And if you feel the same way, tell him to go to hell tomorrow. And, you know, advice like that. And, you know, I, off, I start this lecture talking about should we really listen to successful people talk about why they're successes? Now, of course, that sounds like a stupid question because, of course, we should listen to successful people talk about why they're successes. We want to become successes also. And so, yeah, yeah, never tell a guy to go to hell today. You can always wait, and if you feel like you, you, know, you really should, you can tell him that tomorrow. That sounds like a good idea. I'll do that, and maybe that'll help me out in life. Yeah, well, is that really true? Let's take a look at what research can say about this complex issue. And really what this part of the lecture about is the survivorship bias. And, uh, you know, in social psychology, we always talk about biases in thinking, and this is another uh, bias. And the sur survivorship bias is when you draw conclusions from survivors only. Uh, and uh, this image here is like the icon of the survivorship bias. This is a uh, bomber from World War II, and the red dots indicate uh, machine gun damage or flak damage. So what the red dots are is after the planes come back from a bombing mission, they're all shot up and they look at uh, where the uh, flak and where the bullets hit, and a red dot indicates that's where a lot of them hit. And so uh, people, engineers were saying, okay, so this is where here and here and here and here are where these planes are getting hit by bullets. So what we need to do is we want to armor these planes. So we're going to put more armor here and here and here and here. And then an engineer looked at this and he said, oh my God, you people are stupid. You're thinking about this backwards. Uh, that is, the planes you're looking at are the planes that have survived, that have gone on bombing missions and have come back. They've come back with bullet holes in these places, but they don't have any bullet holes here. They don't have any bullet holes here. Why is that? Because planes that have been shot here, planes that have been shot here, have not come back. And so if you want to armor certain parts of the plane, you're going to armor this part, you're going to armor this part, and you're going to armor this part and this part. Because these are the vital parts of the planes, because the planes that get shot in these green parts, they don't come back. And uh, everybody else was only looking at the red areas, thinking that that's going to tell us where we need to really put the armor on these planes. The point is, you should not draw conclusions from survivors only. And that deserves a little bit of explanation. The best way to describe it, or at least my favorite, is to uh, give this example of a con, uh, you know, confidence game. And this is a confidence game where someone is pretending to be a stockbroker or a stock analyst. And uh, what they do is they do this. They send out uh, letters to a thousand people. 
and they say our hedge fund can actually predict the stock markets on a week by week basis. It's amazing our technique. And so, uh, free to you, just to prove to you that our technique works, I am going to give to you today uh, you know, my prediction for what's going to happen next week to the stock market. So you're sending it out to a thousand people, right? And I can't write with my mouse. And so 500 of those letters say, and I predict that the stock market will increase over the next week. And the other half you say, I predict that it's going to fail now or, or drop. Now, of course, logically it has to be one or the other. So half of those people are going to get a letter that correctly predicts the stock market. And so you take those people from last week and you say, so you see, I predicted exactly what the stock market would do. Now, in case you don't believe me, in case you think it's a fluke, I'm going to do it again. And I predict that next week the stock market is going to rise again. And I predict to uh, you know, 250 people, you say, I predict that uh, the stock market is instead going to drop next week. And it does drop. And then you go to these 250 people and you do it again. And you do this for like five weeks. And you know, by, you know, or 10 weeks. And by week 10, you're down to 50 people. But you've proven to them 10 times in a row that you can predict the stock market week by week. And then you say, okay, now send in uh, $50,000 and I'll invest it for you. And they send in the $50,000 and then you go to Cancun or no, someplace even farther away than that, Argentina, I think. Uh, and so that's the con. And remember, nothing's going on except that you're lying to people. And you're saying you know how to predict the stock market. And what happens is, you know, one half of the people you send out letters to, you say it's going to go up or down. And it, when it does, you go back to those people and you just say, ah, see, I was right. Well, let me do it again. And then after a couple weeks, you have people believing you're a market wizard. You ask them for money and they never see you again. That's the con. Now, here's the thing. It's a con job uh, when, you're take, when you're doing this prospectively. Prospectively means that you're looking ahead in time. That is, you start out by saying, I want to con people. And so I'm going to con people by saying uh, to a thousand people, all right, so I can predict the, the stock market, blah, blah, blah. But if we take this whole thing and we think about it retrospectively, that is, we start at a point in time and then we look back in time, uh, the same thing is happening. Where's my uh, pen? The same exact thing is happening, but we don't call those people con men. We call those people Wall Street wizards, or we call them masters of the universe, or we call them brokers. And let me explain what I'm talking about. Back in 1973, a book was published called A Random Walk on Wall Street. And the overall argument of the uh, book was that uh, we have these people, these uh, you know, uh, stockbrokers, these investment bankers, these investors who are giving advice on what stocks to buy. But really, uh, it doesn't matter. You can randomly choose stocks by throwing a dart uh, onto a dartboard with the stock exchange listing. And, that, and wherever the dart hits, that's going to be what you're going to buy this week. And if you randomly buy that, buy stocks week by week and move your money into different stocks week by week, you're going to make money. Uh, because that's the way the stock market works. The stock market grows on average like 12% a year or something like that on average. And so by randomly selecting stocks, you're going to you know, uh, make about 12% on your investments. And even the best investors or you know, stockbrokers or whatever can't consistently do better than 10% per year uh, because they're just choosing at random. 
and there's no special knowledge or understanding of the stock market. Okay, so now let's do that retrospective. Uh, we have, let me skip ahead just to prove to you that it will be retrospective. Uh, we have six bankers or hedge fund managers or investors or advisors and we recognize that these are amazing people. They've made millions of dollars in the stock market. Uh, they've made billions for their clients. They get uh, their predictions of the stock market right every time. Geez, they're amazing. Uh, why is that? Well, let's go back in time and walk through what they did. So what happens way back, you know, a couple quarters ago, we have a whole bunch of investment bankers. You know, and of course, everybody wants to be an investment banker because uh, that's where the big bucks are. But of course, out of college, you have tons of people coming out of college looking for jobs as investment bankers. And you know, it's either just lousy, the, the market's lousy with young people looking to be bankers or investors or whatever. And so they have tons of them, but they get jobs and they start making, they start giving advice to their firms or to their clients. And so what happens is half predict that over the next quarter, the stock market is going to gain money. The other half predict that over the next quarter the stock market is going to lose money. Uh, now uh, they're doing this because they're looking at you know dividends and residuals and blah blah blahs and predicted models but basically what they're doing is they're just guessing maybe or maybe all those models and everything else are just allowing them to feel very intelligent as they're guessing and say that well I'm not really guessing I'm looking at these models but really you're either going to say that the uh, stock market is going to go up or down and it's one or the other okay so then what happens is quarter one goes by and remember I said that half per, uh, predicted gains half predicted losses and so the market drops so those people who predicted losses, they won. And so those who predicted losses are the winners. Those who predicted, oh, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Let me undo that. Oh, I don't want a laser pointer. I want a pen so used to the chalkboard. Okay, so the people who predicted losses, they're the winners. And the people who predicted gains are the losers, and they're fired. And so then, these people are fired, they're no longer making predictions, so now these folks move on to the next quarter. And so in quarter number two, uh, you have that you know smaller selection, but then in quarter number two, uh, they look at their models, they look at whatever, and some predict that the market will go up, some predict the market will go down. And uh, in quarter two, the market gains. So these are the winners, these are the losers, and they're fired. And so at the beginning of quarter three, here we are, these are the six wizards. Uh, because they have the skills, they have the acumen to correctly predict for two quarters exactly what the market is going to do. Uh, nope, they're wizards because of luck, and they really don't have any skills. And listening to them is committing the survivorship bias. Because since they're survivors, we are going to assume that they're somehow better than the losers, and so we're going to believe them. And except that, if you go back to the original quarter, the losers and the winners have done the same thing. That is, 
they have looked at the market projections, they've looked at earning potentials, they looked at dividends. They're all doing the same thing. They're all applying the same skill. But what's happening is that some are coming to one conclusion and just by luck they're right and they survive. And then for another quarter they come to the right conclusion and then just by luck they survive. And then they do that for a couple quarters and they're amazing. They're, they're wizards. And of course each quarter that they're doing this they're investing their own money so they're making some money too or they're getting bonuses from their companies. And so because of that they get rich. Why? Because of luck. They could have been you know, in Las Vegas. Well then what happens is once they have some money something called where oh there it is up there a preferred attachment process begins. Uh, a preferred attachment process is something that is distributed among a number of objects, people, things, whatever, according to how much they have already. So some characteristic is distributed to objects based on how much they already have this characteristic. Uh, this is called the snowball effect or the rich get richer effect or the popular get more popular or the norms get more normier, normier effect. Uh, the fat get fatter effect, whatever you want to call it. You have some type of, uh, you know, uh, characteristic such as you're uh, overweight and so more weight is distributed to people based on how much weight they have in the beginning. So the fat get fatter. Uh, the richer get richer. That is, you have money at the beginning and after a quarter or two you have more because money was given to you or you had the opportunities to make money because you had money to begin with. The rich get ri richer. And I'm uh, going to have to switch over uh, so we can take a look at this and I hope I don't screw things up. Okay, come on. I want you to end uh, discard Okay, we need to watch this video for a minute or so. ...comes for collecting more, and the faster it grows. There doesn't have to be a deliberate choice driving a preferential attachment process. It can happen naturally. Try this. Take a bunch of paper clips and grab any two at random, link them together, and then throw them back in the pile. Now, repeat over and over again. If you grab paper clips that are already part of a chain, link them anyway. More often than not, after a while, you will have a distribution that looks Ziffian. A small number of chains contain a disproportionate amount of the total paperclip count. This is simply because the longer a chain gets, the greater proportion of the whole it contains, which gives it a better chance of being picked up in the future and consequently made even longer. The rich get richer, the big get bigger, the popular get popularer. It's just math. Perhaps languages ziff. And so then the paper clips get paper clippier. And so that's what a preferential attachment process is. And you don't believe it? Well, uh, here's the guy that owns Amazon. I want my marker. There we go. Uh, Jeff Bezos. And. Uh, you know, it says here, and this is an old headline, but it still, you know, uh, is accurate. He made $24 billion during, like, the first couple months of the co-virus pandemic. Uh, how did he make that $24 billion? Did he make a, a, a decision, or did he use his skill, or did he do something to take advantage of the virus? No, he didn't. All he did was just have money to begin with. He had a hundred billion dollars to begin with before the virus hit. And because of that, because he owned 11% of the stock in Amazon, he got more money. And this is an example of the real life uh, preferential treatment process. That is the rich get richer 
because money is distributed based on how much money you have in the first place. And so we have somebody like Warren Buffett and when I teach my business psych classes, you know, the business uh, majors are like, oh, Warren Buffett is so amazing. You know, they have this, these bromance crushes on them. Uh, but, you know, even him, he had some early lucky successes and because he had a couple successes in a row by luck, he got some money, he got some power, and of course, the uh, rich get richer, the powerful get more powerful, so he became more rich and more powerful, and then that snowballed because of the preferential uh, you know, attachment process. And so now, should you listen to his advice? Did his advice get, to, get him to where he is? Uh, not really. Uh, luck and the preferential attachment process did. Saying that, oh, you know, this is really good advice if you want to be a super success because this is what Warren Buffett did and this is why, you know, he's a success. That's really not true. What's going on is that because he's a survivor, we feel that uh, he's special in some way. That is, he knows more, or he can do more, or he's smarter than us. But he's not. He's just luckier. And so we look at two people, Warren Buffett uh, and this guy here. Uh, this guy here started out the same place as Warren Buffett, but his first couple uh, attempts at business failed because of luck. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he didn't have uh, money to begin with or successes to begin with. And so therefore, the preferential treatment process, uh, attachment process didn't kick in for him. And so he didn't, couldn't capitalize on those early successes. But they both had the same beginnings. They both had the same skill. They both have the same education. Uh, it was all down to luck and to the preferential treat attachment process.